Hello guys, how you doing? This is JP Sari Kolia coming to you once ag again with another book review. And this time I want to review Batman by Neil Adams Omnibus. Um, uh, recently I posted a video where I give my recommendations for the best Batman stories. And one of the stories that I mentioned, or the storylines that I mentioned, I, uh, I do recommend uh, for, uh, for, for all of you to read the, the Bronze Age comics of Batman. Particularly, I wouldn't say the Bronze Age, but the transition between the Silver Age and the Bronze Age. And, and there's no one more representative of that time than Neil Adams and Danny O'Neill. A footnote, I, at this book I was very excited when it was announced. Prior to this, there were, uh, the Neil Adams run was actually collected in three different volumes. You can still find them. The hardcover books are really, uh, really hard to find, but the paperbacks are available. Uh, actually, I think volume one is already out. Volume two is coming, but you also can get them in um, uh, digitally, and I have them digitally, so that's where I read. And it contains uh, everything that is here, uh, plus some other extras that we're going to go in detail about this. So when this was announced, uh, I was very excited. I, uh, I pre-ordered this through Amazon. Then I canceled my pre-order because something else came up. I said, you know what, I'm going to go through in-stock trades, and I'm going to get it there. And so when it came out, uh, you know, like everything else in life, something came up, so I didn't purchase it. I just waited a little longer. I said, you know, I'm going to be able to find it. Not expecting that the book will completely you know sell out and it, it did it sold out everywhere and it was hard to find so I was looking everywhere trying to find it and I couldn't find this so I was so disappointed ultimately I was able to find it but I have to order this from the UK so I pay extra money just to get it imported right here on the side says Batman by Neil Adams Omnibus the definitive a dark night and of course he has an intro and he says now for the first time all of Adams legendary Batman work is collected in a single hardcover volume a tom nearly five decades in the making the Batman by Neil Adams Omnibus features more than 1,000 pages of Adams artistic innovation and of course he goes and he also includes Odyssey which to me uh, and to many is a disappointment and it is unfortunate that it was actually good at here uh, I think they could have done other things. So we, we're going to explain that a little further. So a very cool, very cool design here on the side. Okay, now removing the dust jacket, you can see here the year was 1967. That's when, of course, he started uh, working on Batman. And on this side, you have, of course, uh, a, a bio of Neil Adams. Now on the inside, you can see this. This is actually has the cover uh, on the pay on the front has the cover of uh, uh, Batman 251, which is a classic, uh, classic story with the Joker. And of course, it's Neil Adam Omnibus. He has the same thing on the side. See how big and heavy this book is, and this is just a cover from Odyssey. All right, now going into the book, you can see how thick it is. There's so many different pages. This is a heavy, heavy book, but it's well built, well constructed. Mine came pretty well. And of course, here you have said Batman by Neil Adams, Omnibus, art by Neil Adams, of course. But you also have the work of uh, Josh Adams, Vince Coletta, Dick Giordano. You had Michael Golden, Carmen Infantino, Joe Kerbert, uh, Paul Neary, uh, Kevin Nolan, uh, Bill Sienkiewicz, uh, Cor Swan, Scott Williams. Uh, you have writers like Neil Adams. You get um, the Carrie Bates. So you got Leo Dorfman, uh, Mike Frederick, uh, Bob Haney, Dennis O'Neill, Frank Robbins, uh, Len Wein, Mark Wolfman, and of course you got coloring by other people. So there's a lot of the legends in the industry here. And here there's a table of contents, and there are not many many stories here, uh, but there are all the stories uh, that contain, of course, uh, Batman, uh, and they were drawn by uh, Neil Adams. So it starts in back in 1968. So. And all the way to 1975, 74, that's when the last issue did. He actually only did a few issues per year. But all those issues that he did actually defined Batman for generations to come. And, of course, you got uh, a lot of stuff that was added in the Odyssey, of course, which takes a big chunk of this book, if you can look at it. Everything that you see darker in colors, that's just uh, Odyssey. As an introduction, of course, by Neil Adams. And a foreword by Danny O'Neill, um, who was a partner for um, for Adams for for many years. It was him 
and Adams together that really defined Batman uh, and really redefined the character in a way that we actually admire today. And many artists of today, people like Frank Miller, will tell you that they took a lot of inspiration from this era of comics. This is actually the first time uh, he drew Batman in World Finest. Uh, this is Superman and Batman, Superman, Batman, Revenge Squads. All of this has been recolored, and there's been a lot of mentions in regards to this book. A lot of people do not like this recoloring book. And you know what? I respect that decision. I respect what people, particularly people that grew up with uh, uh, with uh, with these collections. I did not grow up reading these comics, of course. You know, I'm in a younger generation. I was born in the late 70s, uh, so uh, and my recollection is from the 80s and 90s. But I got the opportunity to read a lot of these books when I was a kid. Um, he is definitely a lot of people, especially people that grew up with this era. They take it very hard. Um, for this happening, you know, the recoloring, they call this a, this a service from from the art, the original art. And not only that, there's a lot of redrawing parts. If you can compare, and I have seen the original art, and you can compare, not only that, Neil Adams did not only recolor things, or uh, also redrew uh, a lot of stuff, the, the last stuff was redrawn, and um, not only that, there were a lot of changes, like these bubbles are changing, they change their position, so, uh, I don't know, I have mixed emotions. To me, it's not as difficult to kind of grasp the concept because I understand the intention, um, but I do respect the people that find this insulting, to not only to uh, to them, but also to the original artists that actually participated, uh, the inkers, because he inked his work again. Um, a lot of stuff he did here, he did not touch the stuff from Dick Giordano, and we're going to go into detail. I'm going to explain a little more why, because he has a special friendship with Dick Giordano, and Dick Giordano was so important, he do, um, he ink him for so many years, and they're friends, they, um, they all actually started a company together, but if you compare a lot of this art with original art, which I don't have with me, you're going to see the difference, that there's a difference in the colors, and sometimes, worse for good, uh, it kind of brings everything into more contemporary vision, but some other times it doesn't work that's good, and actually it's darker, and it takes away some of that, the life that he has originally, and of course you have Deadman, who was an important character for, for him, actually, he was actually the character that make, you know, made uh, Adams a fan favorite at DC Comics, and let's give a quick, uh, story of Adam so we can get up to speed with who he is as a person and how he started in comics. He was born in New York. Uh, he's a, a Jewish son. He's uh, from a Jewish family. Um, he went into school. He went into what is now called the High School of Art and Design in, in mid-Manhattan, you know, in Midtown. He had a different name when he went there. It was the School of Industrial Art and uh, of course it was a, a high school where he, you know, a lot of kids, you know, went there and actually kind of like they, they learn a trade uh, on the graphic, on the arts and uh, many, many people went, has come to that school and many of these people have become some of the most uh, amazing artists of the time, very influential artists, not uh, and people involved in the arts. So look at see the, you know, this is a, a, an issue with the creeper, which I like actually. I like this cover. Um, so he went there, uh, and of course, when he got out of that school, he wanted to work for DC, but DC was very hermetic about bringing a lot of younger artists, so he did not find a job there, so he ended up with Archie Comics. Look at the Creeper, look at this art, look at this design. Uh, you know, Adams was very important into bringing this new modern techniques, uh, bring more uh, for realistic um, art, and he was definitely influential on that. So he went to work for Archie Comics, he was working there, uh, doing some other work, uh, also he was uh, after Archie Comics. He was doing trying to do some advertisement work, which was not really as good, and he was just barely surviving. Uh, he went into do a lot of uh, publishing. He was doing uh, some um, uh, newspaper strips where actually his art uh, was more realistic. And actually, all of those things, all those cues he got from doing that work, really helped him into to becoming, you know, to kind of develop his art, which was very realistic. And that's one of the reasons why originally uh, a lot of comic book companies did. Uh, didn't care much about it because they found that, that there was no niche or no place for him there. Um, uh, and look at this cover. This is a great cover. You know, this is the thing, you know, he, um, 
Neil Adams was for for many years was DC DC's best weapon, you know, when it comes about creating this art. So you know, uh, he went into publishing. You know, he was doing a lot of advertising. Uh, he was working for uh, uh, for some of the companies back in the day, agencies that did a lot of advertising, particularly uh, utilizing a lot of comic book art. Back in the day, you can see a lot of magazines. They used to have this comic book uh, ad kind of ads with like comic book figures, and um, of course, he was involved into all of that. Um, um, and, and he did that for, for a little bit, for quite a while, uh, trying to make it, you know, and, and he ended up then working for Warren Publishing, who was um, a company that did a lot of horror, black and white horror stories like Vampirella and other stories. So he was working there for a little bit. He tried again with DC, but DC kind of always shut the door on him. And uh, look at this cover. Look at this face. Very realistic face. I like this cover with Aquaman. These are the covers. These were the covers of the time. You know, these were totally different than before. There were there were no more campiness in the character. We are getting more realistic look and a more realistic take of the character. Sometimes the colors are so dark that changes the mood and um, it, it becomes a little hard to understand. But look at this how lively, how good it is. So ultimately, of course, he, he went to DC. He was working with Warren. He got an opportunity to go and start with DC on their war lines, even though. He was against the war. Uh, he was against the Vietnam War during that time, and uh, he's always been very political. Uh, and um, he started working for them, doing some of the stuff there and some of the other, um, uh, other of the comics that were based mostly on uh, TV shows, on TV personalities, and things like that. So it was not really doing superhero stuff. Actually, they turned him down to do a lot of stuff for Batman. He wanted to, you know, to draw Batman. Um, ultimately, an opening was given. He started doing the covers for some, I think, Superman and other or another, you know, other comic uh, superheroes. And uh, of course, a little by little, he started gaining a little more work. So, Deadman became a fan favorite. When people started loving what he did with Deadman, uh, then he ended up doing stuff for Batman. And the rest is history. Uh, with Danny O'Neill, with Danny O'Neill, he did such a Great job. One of the things that people admire about this timeline, of this time, right, is that Batman was brought back to the basics. And, you know, if you're going to see something that I normally mention in my videos about the, the artists that I uh, admire are the ones that actually take a story and bring it back to its roots. During the 60s, of course, you have the TV show, which was very famous, and everybody loved the TV show. I love uh, Adam West, you know, version of Batman. Who doesn't? But there was a lot of campiness, and of course, the comics uh, 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 code authority right here. You can see the design, you know, the uh, comics code. They actually uh, and look at this cover; just a great cover there. Very good covers. These are good covers, you know. And a lot of this has to do with his publishing career and the time when he was doing advertisement, uh, learning to be able to do that, um, you know, be able to learn how to uh, advertise something, how to, you know. You know, you know how to catch the attention of people. How you know grab people's attention just by the cover alone. He is an expert. He was pretty much one of the forefathers. I don't say what the forefather, but one of the big icons. One of the ones that actually enforced this technique uh, that comics really got uh, during this time. Uh, I think he was one of the best implementing that. That's one of the reasons why he was a cover artist for so long. You know, you can have great artists in the center, but you need someone that really catches the eye. He was actually influential in doing that. He was one of the first ones actually doing that in a more concise way. Green Arrow. He was very good at Green Arrow. And not just that, he gave Green Arrow the difference. Green Arrow before that, it was totally different. It was a knockoff of Batman. But he gave him a more Robin Hood like, and of course, given the goatee and, and all of that. So his here with Green Arrow, it's just good, you know. It's just this, you know. He he was in a time. Uh, this were comic books going back to the original roots, but also bring making it relevant. Look at this, very good panel here with Green Arrow. Love Green Arrow. Who doesn't love Green Arrow? Um, he made him just relevant. Um, he made um, you know Green Lantern and then Green Arrow together and their own very relevant. Deadman definitely here. Look at that cover, just phenomenal cover. Now a little you know the colors here are not as great, but man you know just the idea of having this here. Um, this is a great collection, just the drawing part. And Dick Giordano was definitely doing, uh, I think Dick Giordano was the best anchor for the time. You know, he worked for DC, a lot of stuff for Batman for years. Um, 
during you know during that time because he he was not only doing stuff with Batman when he be, be you know he was doing stuff for Marvel he was doing uh, and I'm talking about Adams he was doing doing still still doing stuff for Warren he was still doing stuff for for publishers uh, after this book ended Dick him and Dick Giordano starting their own company Continuity Associates this collection is not only about uh, uh, in this case Adams it's also about O'Neill. And it's also about this decade or this generation of this time where the the Batman was moving from the companies that was brought by the show and by the into a more realistic take. This is the great thing about Adam. So that's one of the reasons why at first he was not well received in comics be, uh, from the industry part because comics were. Uh, uh, in this case, the companies were used to this more, uh, you know, comic-y, this like unrealistic take on characters, very kiddish, but he was very realistic. And, you know, when that's a lot of people that are not visionaries or people that do not see beyond that, they just saw something that was not marketable for them. They didn't see the potential. There was in the status quo, he was beyond that. He was taking a realistic to, to, uh, look into it. He was more realistic, uh, and all that came into play uh, later. Later, when re when they realized, when the people realized that fans wanted something that looked more like the realistic Batman, something that looks like someone walking down the street, someone that you can see as the Batman. So he was part of that movement that took. You know, this comics into a new generation, into the Bronze Age, when you see a big array of artists creating uh, a, a more modern take, a more realistic take of characters, and the physicality, the, the, the close-ups, you see that, you know, the angles, you see the lighting effects that change the mood, all of that. Adams was instrumental. I think, you know, there's, there were two artists during that time that were influential on, on the way these characters or these stories were created. Of course, you got James Taranko uh, at Marvel, and of course, you have, um, uh, in this case, of course, Adams at DC. There were totally different techniques, but their techniques were based on the more realistic look and take into the characters. Man Bat, one of his creations with Danny O'Neill, really cool. I always like Man Bat. And look at this, Batman and Batgirl, very good covers. Covers are, you know, on point. These are the covers that take that many other artists. This realistic take. Uh, and, of course, he did it well. Many younger artists in this new generation, of course, they're ta they have taken their cues. Of course, you take your cues from uh, uh, younger artists now take their cues from artists like uh, uh, Jim Lee, people like that. But you have to realize that Jim Lee took cues from people like John Byrne. People like uh, uh, Walt Simonson, who took their cues, uh, and Ramita Jr., people that took their cues actually from Adams, you know, Neil Adams, Jim Steranko, Gene Colan, people from that time. They took their cues from this generation, from this people, from people during that time that uh, they were doing the art, uh, Joe Kubert, uh, people that were doing a, a totally different take into characters. So you can see that here. Uh, look at that. Really cool. Really, really cool. I don't know. Just man, it's just looking at this art. It's hard for me to concentrate. If you have seen my videos, uh, you know, of course, I talk a lot, which some people might dislike. But uh, I like to give a lot of pointers, a lot of history into it, because this is more about just the look of it. It's just the comic of it. I've seen some reviews, read some reviews, people that criticize the the, the redrawn part of this. I love this one. This is a, a Len Wein um, a story. I love that. You know, it's just the way. Uh, this artists are here, you know. This, they have they express themselves, and um, I don't know. It's just, it's just great. Uh, I love this one. Even though you know I didn't grow up with this, I can appreciate what was done here. Yes, I know that the colors are different, but regardless of that, it's fun to see these covers. And I liked actually the covers were kept original. They kept the originals in the covers. Um, just they kind of redrew, you know. They redrawn all the things in the inside um, and most of this stuff here. But uh, this I contain, like I said, on the previous collection from Adams. Uh, and those have more stuff, more. Um, and here, here, this one here. This is a good one, Daughter of the Demon. This is the introduction of Ras al Ghul. Um, oh, man, this is a classic. You know, this is a classic story. Look at that, Robin being shot. Hmm. You know, that's a prophetic word right there. <laughs> at least for the future of Batman and things that would happen later on. You know, books are, you know, this is a, a great, great book. Of course, the introduction of Talia, all of this. I don't know. I just, It's just cool. Look at that movement. This is the part where you can see the movement. You know, he's throwing that punch. 
looks realistic. It's not unrealistic. Look at that punch. This is the part. Talia. Another thing about a lot of people love Neil Adams is the way he he drew and he draws because he's still alive, of course. Uh, women. Uh, he does great. Batman and Robin. He he really much revived Two Face. Um, brought Two Face to to the forefront alongside Neil, of course. Um, Danny O'Neill to become a, a, a really a big foe for the character. Like I said, women, his, uh, the drawing of women is very realistic. When you see that, you see a lot of the takes that he took. All the years that he went into before really got you know into DC and comics, his experience as an advertiser, his experience working for black and white comics, his experience working for uh, newspaper strips, all of that really came into play and the way he would be, you know develop his art and brought it here, what people really love. He changed the industry from the inside. You know, he changed the industry in the aspirations and the desires and, of course, the, the, the vision of the comic book stories to, to be more relevant to the time being. Uh, it was his, uh, his run that used so more uh, situations. And many consider, for example, uh, when you look at Green Arrow and, of course, uh, Green Lantern, which we'll review at some point. And that, what many consider that the end, part of the end, some of the, the stories alongside other stories uh, like the death uh, of Gwen Stacy at Marvel, things like that, they, they be, they, there was a change into comics from the Silver Age into to the Bronze Age. Uh, of course, you saw the issues in, re, in regards to drug addiction and uh, racism, all of those things, all those factors that still play good uh, to this day, you know, and uh, he was part of that. He was always very political. You know, he was just drawing art, but he was also inspiring art uh, during that time and he was very instrumental actually in changing the way the company the companies would represent and we uh, take care of their artists here's another Ra's al Ghul the, Dem the Demon Lives Again another classic cover classic storyline these are classics you know of course the art is, re uh, is recolor but the covers are still maintain the original art which is just phenomenal. Uh, this this thing, you know, that you see here with Ra's al Ghul, this interaction that they have had for so many years, it really plays a big part on, on the way the stories are uh, for Batman. Uh, look at this. This is the one that took 251. Look out. Uh, gotten the Joker's back in town. The Joker's five-way revenge. This is a classic. You know, before that, you know, the Joker was just a prankster. He was doing stuff. Of course, he was limited by the 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 comic uh, the code authority. But it was until, of course, this issue where he was brought back to be the the, the crazy person, a psychopath, uh, a killer that loves to kill. And this was the turning point for the Joker again into the darker stories of the Joker. Uh, if you want. I want to thank someone that you have to thank uh, thank Danny uh, Danny O'Neill and Adams for for actually bringing uh, the Joker back to the origin story. A look at this one. I like this one. So it was him. It was just him. And I like this one. This is another Len Wein uh, storybook. Uh, I love Len Wein's uh, writing. I think he was very, uh, in my opinion, he was um, better uh, at, at those stories, the darker stories, the kind of like um, supernatural, darker. Um, his stories, I think, then I was with Danny O'Neill. I will review some of this stuff from him at some point, but you can see here Batman, the Joker, all of this is cool. But, you know, going back to what I was saying about Adams, he was uh, very instrumental into to defending the rights of creators. He was uh, he, he wanted to unionize uh, the comic book artists of the time. He was involved in the process. He, he fought for, for the rights. Uh, here you can see covers uh, of a lot of... Uh, you know, the, the, the rights of this artist, you know, he was instrumental into a lot of the stuff that happened for even Jack Kirby. He fought and was able to get art from Marvel, able to, to, to kind of force Marvel in legal battle to return the original art to him, uh, Adams, and art to Jack Kirby and many other artists. So he was instrumental in a time where a lot of people were not fighting for the rights, so they didn't know what to do. He was very involved in the process. He was instrumental in that actually doing that and here it goes into what would be the 
the black sheep of the story or the one that nobody really would care much about and this is Odyssey. This is our return after of course you know um, 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 uh, in this case here's ba uh, Odyssey a very hairy Batman. Uh, after of course he left uh, DC back in the 70s he dedicated more himself to a company that he created with Dick Giordano which was Continuity Associates that became Continuity Studios and is based in New York and Los Angeles and what they do is a lot of uh, advertisement uh, digital design. Uh, originally they did also a lot of uh, um, the panels and art, uh, particularly for movies. He was there for many years doing working in, in other projects uh, and on his own for other companies. He was not doing comic books. So until the early 2000s, of course, uh, the mid 2000s, that's when actually he was invited back to DC and he did this work. And this is considered the worst art, uh, probably the worst Batman story you can ever find. Well, I, I can, I'm sure there's other stories that are worse than this. But it's just completely nonsensical. It's really off. He is actually the writer. What really shows that, you know, he's not a good writer. You know, he can come up with ideas, but he's not a writer. There's people like George Perez. There's people that are very um, good, uh, you know, that were able to transfer into becoming, you know, writers, but they're not the greatest. And I don't think Adams was that great. You know, I think he's a great artist and a great inspiration. And um, but as an uh, as a as a creator as creating the story itself he is not good. There's a lot of here. There's a lot of blood. There's a lot of shooting. There's a lot of even cursing uh, at some points. It just it's just off. You know. It, of course, he misses the mark. Uh, the inking part when he inks his own stuff it's not that great of course you we're missing Dick Giordano here at least to do the inking you know because he was the be best inker of the time and also the best inker for Adams but you can see that here it's just dark the colors are off everything is off and you know this is I don't know, this is like an intention. This is like, to me, like the uh, Adam's trying to be modern, which is not his take. I think, you know, he is good. You know, even, you know, Talia looks so off. Look at that face. She looks a, a bit Asian, which she's not. Well, kind of, but she is not. So it, it looks off. You know, it's just, there are a couple of things here in the art part, but just as the art, you can kind of forgive the art. It's just the colors, just the inking just the expressions, uh, just the, 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 you know, how, you know, the, you know, it's so lousy, it's a lousy story, definitely disappointment, to me it's like, they could have just simply get rid of this, and add some of the stuff that didn't came, uh, that they, they, they actually transferred some of the stuff that was on the original, on the three volumes, a lot of the, uh, there were some sketches, there were some R, some, a lot of covers that actually were not included in the cover section here, and some other issues that are missing in this collection, where actually Adams was kind of like a part uh, artist, uh, also, also did stuff with, with other artists, you know, and they did stuff together. So the fact that it's not here, uh, some other missing parts actually complement some of the stories here are not good. And you can see right here, uh, I really didn't like the way he he drew uh, Aquaman. Look at that mullet. It's just not good. It's just not good. These stories here are not good. It's just all over the place. You know, it's actually Batman telling a story or telling a story while he's just eating breakfast. And it goes every issue it's just like that. But he brings the dead man. He brings uh, all the famous characters that he drew, the Joker. But the colors, you know, the colors are just all over the place. It has no dimension. It's just, it's just bad. And the story is just worse. It's just dumb. You know, there's dinosaurs. They go underground. They, they, they fight gnomes. They do all kind of crazy stuff, you know, Batman shoots people, you know, he kills people uh, or, uh, you know, attempts to kill people. I don't know, it just, it just totally, it gets you off to a point that you just, you just lose it. You lose it. You know, it's one of the bad stories. Like, dear, look at this. He's shooting the sensei, which it was a fake thing to do, but it was uh, it still, you know, just, it made no sense. Uh, thankfully, it's over. <laughs> and here you have the covers. These are covers that he drew, and they're all included. Batman and the Spectre. The Spectre was one of the also one of the characters that defined the people. There were a lot of people were they favor. Um, they he a lot of fans. They loved his Spectre uh, take. Of course, you have Batman here and Plastic Man. Uh, you know, a lot of stuff here. They're still missing some covers, actually, from the Justice League, where actually there are a lot of, you know, it's Batman uh, alongside um, of the other superheroes, Batman, Batgirl. Man, this book is huge. It's a great omnibus just in the sense of the packaging and what is included here. Really look at those. Phantom, Commissioner Gordon. Man, just a lot of stuff. Look at this. Adam Strange. 
great you know there's a bunch of great covers here good covers this is just the covers As a matter of fact they should have just only a book just for covers all the covers that you know he has done for dc which were plenty you know because that's what he did a career on is just drawing that you know as you can i'll tell you they're, they're, he only did a few um you know, uh, Batman stories uh, throughout the years, uh, only a few. They're not that many, but they were so influential for the character. Batgirl, uh, Detective Comics, he did a lot of this stuff here. So it's good that you have all this included here. And although he's missing stuff, the saga of Ra's al Ghul and a character Two-Face. Uh, there's a lot of, you know, a lot of good covers. Some art here, very cool art. Which is good. Still missing some other art that the you know, other sketch part section that actually is included in the volume three. Well, in conclusion, do I recommend this book? Um, it is hard to tell. Yes and no. Uh, yes, if you're able to get it, I would say go for it. Not for the crazy prices that is pretty much doing it right now. Uh, as uh, from a standpoint of a fan of the era of the 50s and 60s and that that particular era of comics you might dislike this if you grew up in that era you might dislike the new recoloring if you're a newer fan I, I do recommend it but I do not recommend this I recommend the singular uh, the three volumes that were prior to this the hardcover you can find them or you can also get the new trade paperbacks or the digital versions which it includes everything except odyssey which to me it's just not good and it shouldn't be here i think we they have saved a lot they could actually without what addition of this collection before it was they came out what i wanted to see was actually it would have been so great if they have the original uh versions and the uh and also the recolor one so people can compare and like some of the they have some of the absolute versions they have both versions that would be have phenomenal they have done that here and added all the sections of the previous or the, at least the covers of the sketchbooks included on the previous collections uh that is not included here you know they could have done that easily by just removing this you know the odyssey uh besides that i i really think neil adams i think neil adams has been a motor for the industry not only as an artist but also as an advocate for people's rights a lot of people i have heard many comments about people that praise neil adams so people don't like neil adams because they think or they say that it's all about self-promotion in his case which you know i don't know the person i don't know it in a deep way to say this is what he does but one thing is true if you talk to the artists within the industry not the fans, but the artists, not the people that, you know, they get offended because someone doesn't sign something at a convention. I'm talking about the people that have worked with him. They have great respect for what he has done. He was instrumental in Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster's getting a pension from DC for they're the creators of Superman. He was instrumental enough for them getting paid for all the stuff that they did, things that they didn't get paid. He was instrumental for Jack Kirby to get recognition for what he did and getting some of his art back. He was instrumental in helping the industry and advocating for the rights of in the industry. He hasn't been involved in social issues. You know, he and, and, and he's a Jewish, so he's also involved in, in, in a projects that really uh, bring uh, uh, remembrance, that bring, uh, you know, they keep the memory alive for the, the victims of the Holocaust. Uh, and, and you know, in teaching people about it, sadly, Odyssey became kind of like the punchline. A lot of people used to say, you know, to criticize his art, which is sad because definitely that should have been the case because that kind of tarnishes reputation prior to it. But if you really want to know Neil Adams, you know, don't look at Odyssey as the as the image of who he is. Look at what he did prior to it, so you have a really a grasp. You can grasp the concept and the understand. You can understand what Neil Adams means for the industry and what he has done for the. Industry. Industry. I definitely, uh, I really praise what he has done, and I do recommend the stories that are included here. I might not recommend this omnibus, but I do recommend other books, and I do recommend for you to read them uh, and to really, uh, you know, to see how he established, alongside, of course, Danny Zaniel and many others like Lynn Wynn and other people, established a character like Batman into what we know now of Batman, the one that you know has been used as inspiration from people from Frank Miller, from uh, other people nowadays you know the the new modern art writers that they took inspiration from this batman so uh once again thank you for watching this video please like comment and subscribe don't forget to hit the notification button so you're reminded of every single video so god bless and i'll talk to you again bye bye